Welcome to the Hands-On Business Podcast, the place you always come to get tips, tricks, and advice on growing your business. Now, people are telling me that they come back time and again due to the practical advice that they get, which is really rewarding. And the reason I set up the podcast, as you know, is I wanted to create a place where people could come and hear real business leaders discussing systems, methodologies, and strategies that they have actually used to help them catapult growth in their business. So one of my recent reviews from M. Cesar Esquire said, I'm a new listener and I like you already. I can tell he knows what he's doing. Other business podcasts might be a little flashier, but they are too abstract. Hakeem spelled things out better. Highly recommend. So thank you very much for that. Uh, not too sure what he means by other podcasts may be flashier. But I think he's basically saying I'm down to earth. So I'll take that. So stick around as I'm your podcast host, Hakeem Adebi, and I've grown several small businesses to multi-million pound enterprises and noticed that there wasn't really a place that focused on where I was, i.e. growing a small business. All the content seemed to be about big business and often just a lot of theory and not practical, implementable advice. So that's what you get on my show. Today, I'm going to be talking to Nishant Varma, a man who started out life as a chartered accountant, but then in 2015, joined his dad in the commercialization of a unique medical device. Six years later, they sold that business to a large US multinational healthcare company. So today, I'm going to be picking Nishant's brains about five essential tips to successfully globalize a product. Now, in this case, it's just happened that the example is a healthcare product, but the advice can be used for any product or service that you may have. And in fact, one may say it'll be easier to do what Nishat tells you to do outside of healthcare due to the highly regulated environment that you have in the healthcare space. Now, I'm actually a complete and utter healthcare nerd. I have no uh, embarrassment in saying that because I've worked in the healthcare space for over 25 years. However, I know that you're going to love it as much as me because Nishant is intelligent, engaging, and most of all, like all of my guests, he gives great practical advice. He's going to guide you through what you need to do to commercialize a product successfully, but also the key things to avoid, which is obviously just as important. So I hope you enjoy listening as much as we enjoy doing it. Happy listening. Welcome, Nishant, and thanks for agreeing to be on the show today. Most people may or may not know that I've been in the healthcare space for over 25 years, building and growing businesses. So you can probably imagine that I'm really looking forward to getting into some deep discussion with Nishant about how you go about globalizing healthcare products. So like most of my guests, Nishant has a very interesting journey to be sitting on the show today. Uh, and he started life as an economics graduate and a chartered accountant at PwC, which is very interesting because I think the last two or three people I've had on, maybe I think probably around that, have been at PwC at some point. So that's very interesting. Uh, purely coincidental, I can assure you. Um, so after uh, he, sorry, he left PwC and he then joined his father in 2015 uh, to help his dad commercialize an innovative medical device that his dad had actually invented. And then in 2017, they got FDA approval and Nishan specifically uh, on his own focused on developing the US market. So we're going to definitely talk about that. And then about four years later, 2021, um, their company was then acquired by a large multinational in the US. And Nishan is now building on uh, or focusing on building his second business. So I thought this is the perfect time to get him on to, to actually share that journey and start discussing that journey. Because based on that, what we're here to talk about today on the show is five essential tips to successfully globalize a product. So we'll welcome Nishant. Thank you, Hakeem. Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation and sharing some of my, my journey. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to finding out more about it. So the, the first question I have, uh, and I'm really keen to know the answer to is, how do you go from being an accountant at PwC to building a healthcare business and selling it? It's a good. It's a good question. It's a. It's a hard question to answer. You know, in a in a 
sort of concise way, but I'll, I'll give it a go. So I, I studied economics, as you mentioned. I then wanted to you know, pursue some further education after my degree. I had some great advice, actually, um, around that time. Uh, someone recommended looking into doing the uh, Chartered Accountancy qualification, especially if, uh, if I was looking to get into to business at a later stage. It would really set some of the, the foundations for that. So I decided to go ahead with um, uh, joining PwC on their graduate scheme. I completed my Chartered Accountancy qualification with them. A few years after I had um, finished with PwC, I then joined Barclays uh, and I worked as a uh, equity analyst for Barclays, which was a really interesting role because I essentially um, looked at listed companies, uh, learnt about their strategies for growth, wrote sector specific research on the companies and gave um, investment recommendations to clients such as hedge, hedge funds. Um, I also was able to learn about valuation methodologies uh, for these different companies. So I really got, got, got a chance to gain in-depth knowledge into some of these uh, large listed companies. Around that time, this was probably 2013, 2014, around that time, my father, who is an obstetrician, um, he, he's been practicing for about 40 years as an obstetrician. He, around that time, had developed or started developing a, a medical device an idea that he had, he had came up with um, due to an actually a very tragic situation in his hospital. He was called in the middle of the night um, by one of the, the junior doctors. They were having difficulties uh, during a cesarean section. They really struggled to get the baby out. The baby's head essentially had become impacted in the maternal pelvis. They eventually delivered the baby, um, but the mother had suffered severe complications. She lost a lot of blood, um, but they managed to deliver the baby. Uh, my father came to the hospital just to check that things are okay. He had to then help repair the mother's complications. And very tragically, he, he got a phone call about 12 hours later saying that the baby did not survive the delivery. Uh, he then had to tell the parents the, the news about this really tragic situation. And um, it really led him on a journey to try and find a way of safely delivering the babies during these potentially difficult cesarean sections. So this, this had happened um, probably about 15 years ago now. He then spent a few years uh, developing um, a, a potential device. There was a lots of clinical um, uh, sort of mechanical testing that needed to be done before they could even use the device in a real clinical setting. So there was really a, you know, a few years he spent developing this device. In 2011, he had the finished prototype and they were looking, he was looking at ways to bring this to, to the market. He around that time actually found um, found a, a contact at Johnson & Johnson, someone who'd had many years um, in, in the women's health space and in sales, he was a sales director there. They then partnered up and they looked at trying to bring this product uh, to, to the UK. A couple of years into that journey, this sort of takes us to 2015, I was still at Barclays. My dad, we have a very close relationship. I would sort of been hearing about this journey over the past few years. I, I found it sort of very interesting. I, although I was, you know, Things are going well in my career. Um, you know, they, I was I was enjoying it. I, I al always felt that I wanted to be involved in a startup. I felt that I wanted to be involved with something where I could make a much bigger impact. And in 2015, I took a somewhat calculated risk. You could call it a leap of faith, but I decided to join my father uh, in his uh, medical device business in the in the very early stages. And that sort of got me from I guess from my initial career to to, to joining the business. Uh, I don't know how much detail you want me to go into, sort of past that point or something no, we're, 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 we're going to pick that up as we as we go through but something you said right at the beginning was about that you got some really good advice when you went into economics and then when you went i think to pwc about doing uh going to pwc because it'll give you uh, an opportunity in business if you want to go into that is that something that you had always wanted to do or was that just uh something that was on in the back of your mind what what was the rationale around there yeah, I guess sort of back then when I, I, I sort of coming into my final, final year of university and I was looking at where I wanted to, you know, um, go and complete a graduate program. I was looking at some of the investment banks. I was looking at some of the consultancy firms, looking at the, um, you know, sort of uh, advisory businesses such as you know, PwC, the big, big four accounting firms. And the the advice that I'd got uh, was really if if you are looking to potentially go in into business or, or start up a business and that was something I always had in the back of my mind even in my final year of university I knew that I wanted to gain some experience in a, in a big company in a sort of corporate environment and, and gain that experience for a few years but I, I eventually felt that I would pursue some sort of uh, you know startup journey so that was really the, the, the thinking behind it 
and uh, the, the Chartered Accountancy Qualification really gave me a, a good, good background in sort of fundamentals of business, uh, business valuations, you know, case studies, the sort of tax implications, accounting and things like that. So it was, re it was really, really useful, uh, even, even sort of later on in, in my journey. I can well imagine it. And, and I'm sure your dad was very thankful of that, <laughs> that support uh, in the business. So, so and, and that, that leads me on to your dad, because obviously he's an ob obstetrician. You said he was an obstetrician for 40 years. So did he have any experience prior to, obviously, this uh, harrowing incident, uh, which obviously kicked him into action? Did he have any experience in developing products or innov innovations of any kind? It's interesting. He didn't have any uh, specific experience. I mean, this is the first time he had really uh, developed um, a, a product. But really, you know, when when you when I speak with my father over the years, he's for for many many years, even prior to the the product that he developed, he's always said that there is huge room for improvement in and and innovation in the field of obstetrics. You know, some of the some of the methods, some of the devices that are being used have been around for you know 50, 100 years in in some cases, and it's a it's a, it's a field where it's quite difficult to bring innovation to it because you know there it is a high risk um, you know childbirth is clearly a high risk um, procedure, so to sort of bring and try new devices can be quite challenging. So he's always always felt that there's significant room for improvement and innovation in in, in that field. Um, he also sort of jokes that if he didn't become a doctor, he, he always, always had an interest in engineering. So he thinks that he, if it wasn't a doctor, he would have taken that path. So I think he's already had, always had a passion and an interest in, in terms of design and engineering and development. And he's had a good understanding of the basics of sort of physics and mechanics and materials and, 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 and those sorts of things. I think that those sort of combined, um, you know, plus the, obviously the very tragic situation that he, that he sort of witnessed, and had to assist with is really all the sort of factors that, that led him to eventually develop a device. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because it's, it's, I mean, I think people often will, will look at someone like an obstetrician or someone in those sort of jobs which are considered to be, you know, very, very good jobs, very well respected, and would be surprised that someone of that nature would then look at another career effectively. But interesting enough, when you look at just from a business point of view, what he's really done is he's identified a need. Uh, because he's had the tragic circumstances and then he's, he, he's used that need. And I think you mentioned, you know, that the, 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 the area itself needs improvements and innovations. Uh, so because he's identified that need, he's then looked at, well, how do I fulfill that need? Um, and what do I need to do? And then, you know, that's, that's kicked the ball rolling, which is, which is, which is, you know, standard stuff. But obviously that's not thinking the standard stuff because he's an obstetrician, but it's, it's interesting the way it, it's, it all comes about and it seems to be, whatever uh, product that's going to be successful will probably go through that same sort of process in terms of somebody identifying a gap in the market. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the rare things is, you know, they sort of, the, I've met so many doctors over the, over the years and um, many, many, many doctors have sort of said to me that, you know, well, firstly, they wish they had thought of the, thought of this idea because it's such a simple idea. But, but secondly, you know, I've come across many doctors who have had ideas over the years. They've had had sort of ideas, at least in their mind, of, of things that they could do to improve uh, their, their practice or devices they, in, in theory, that might work. But having an idea, you know, is one thing, but actually sort of bringing it through the, the, the process of bringing a physical product to the market it is a whole sort of, you know, different journey that not many people embark on, I would say. It's just a challenge, especially managing an already sort of busy workload load and then trying to trying to essentially start a, a company on the side is a, is a difficult thing to do. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting you just mentioned that because the two things you just described are effectively having an idea or a vision uh, and then taking action. Those are the two critical uh, things. And I, I, now, I, I think it's been... Um, attributed to Nelson Mandela, but I think it's also been attributed to Gandhi as well, about action and vision. The action and vision, action without vision is just wasting time. Uh, vision without action is just a dream, but action with vision can change the world. Uh, and I think, you know, and I'm not putting too fine a point on it, but that's exactly what's happened with the fetal pillow, because it has completely changed a practice within uh, the obstetric field. So that's, that's a really interesting point for people who are listening to take on board you know lots of people have ideas you know the amount of time the amount of time you speak to people when something's invented and they'll say oh i had that idea 10 years ago <laughs> that's great but having yeah. the idea doesn't achieve anything it's, you have to put it into action you have to do something so absolutely 
based on that, where did you start then? Because it's like, you know, your dad's obviously got some ideas, but he's not a businessman. You've got all that business acumen. You're working with a guy from Johnson Johnson. Where, where when you came in, where where was the business at? And then what do you what, you know what do you think? Well, we need to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, it was an you know it was an interesting conversation I, I had with my father, especially uh, you know around the time I was uh, I was planning to sort of leave my leave my job. He was very re very reluctant for me to do that actually because. You know, he he said you, you shouldn't be uh, you know you're taking a bit of a chance there, leaving uh, your your career where things are going very well. And you know, we're, I'm not sure how this is going to sort of play out. Um, but I, I I sort of had belief in in what he was doing. I had belief in the product. I really felt there was huge potential in in sort of having an impact on 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 the industry and impacting um, you know sort of improving safety of childbirth and helping many mothers and babies. So I I genuinely felt there was um, you know real potential there. Um, when I when I left my job, I initially joined my my dad, and I mentioned that there was someone else that was involved, um, an, an ex director at uh, Johnson and Johnson. So there was really the two of them in the business. I was the third one to come along. Uh, at that time, they had already uh, opened up a, a a handful of accounts in in the UK, uh, very very sort of early on in in the process. And when we were discussing about my sort of role in in what I could do for the business it was you know there wasn't really a fixed role it was ultimately you know doing whatever I, I could to try and help the business grow and I, I essentially said to my father you know I, I want to this is completely new to me this is essentially a new industry a new career and I, I really want to learn from the ground up and the, the way to do that is going to be the person that's on the ground selling directly to the hospitals and out in the field going to meet the doctors face to face and really learning from the ground up. So that was uh, that was the sort of primary focus of, of my role when I first joined the business was really London and the South East was going there, going out and trying to get the message out there about fetal glow and trying to convince these hospitals that they should consider using the fetal glow. So in other words, getting your hands dirty, getting them to understand the market so that everything else that comes out of that is based on understanding and facts rather than your view, which is, which is an interesting one because you get lots of people who will pontificate about markets that they're in, in sales mm -hmm. position, marketing position, then you say, all right, when was the last time you saw a customer? Oh, yeah. no, I've seen a customer. <laughs> right, that's an, inter that's an interesting uh, way to go about trying to uh, penetrate a market without understanding uh, what's actually going on. So, so that's, that's, I think, very important, actually. Um, and, then, and then, you know, so... Because obviously that's a new environment. What was the hardest thing you found when you when you joined? Because you know, where people are always talking about, oh, it's great, and you know, I did this, I went on a journey. But I'm sure that uh, having left a stable job, uh, going into an environment where your dad knows very well, but you don't, uh, and then trying to really navigate through um, that and then develop a business, that must have been challenging. Yeah, you know, what what was the most challenging thing? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think I mentioned it um, previously, but the the probably the biggest biggest um, or the sort of biggest challenge I, I found was I I essentially had changed career and industry almost overnight, and with, with my role of sort of going out to the hospitals, I was essentially being thrown in into the deep end from, from day one, and you know I was having to convince doctors to consider using a brand new medical device potentially change their practice and the way they've been doing things for, for, for many, many years. And I was essentially having to have these conversations with little to no experience in, in this industry or in terms of selling a medical device. So I think it was, you know, that that sort of being thrown into the deep end was definitely the biggest challenge. It's, um, you know, it's, it's funny, me and my dad joke uh, about it now when I, when I, in those first few days when I sort of uh, joined the business, I, I spent three days with my dad and he gave me a crash course in childbirth for, for three days. So he, uh, <laughs> he tried to condense his, uh, his 40 years of knowledge into three days uh, and, uh, you know, pass it on to me, someone who'd only really dealt with finance over the years. So it was, uh, it was interesting uh, to, to say the least, but, uh, you know, looking back, I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I've always enjoyed the challenge and that was really was a big challenge, but I, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. And so what would your advice to be? Because, because, I mean, I've worked in healthcare, healthcare as I said, for over 25 years, and actually to get into medical device selling or pharmaceutical selling, generally, they will say, well, you need to have a degree and you need to have a life science background, etc. Uh, and I've always felt, and I've actually recruited people from outside uh, of that background, because I think that actually your attitude 
and your thirst for knowledge are more important than having a life science background. If you've got all those things that a life science background or a medical background, or the better. But so, because obviously this is going out to lots of people who'll be listening and thinking about uh, areas that maybe they like, but haven't got an experience in, what would your advice to be to them in terms of how you got over that? How did you bridge that gap? Because it is a massive difference going from finance into like the medical field where, you know, it's, it is life or death. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you, you touched upon it, the, the sort of willingness to learn, I think is um, a very, very important. I think the uh, ability, especially when you're looking specifically at sort of medical device sales, I think the ability to develop relationships is hugely important as well. Uh, being being passionate about your field is very, very important because you may have a medical background, but if you're out there presenting, you know, to a, a department meeting, for example, and you're pitching a or presenting on a, on a new device, you know, you may know sort of the facts behind it, which obviously you, you need to know, but you need to have passion and be able to sort of articulate the, the value behind the device as well. So I think that's really important. So willingness to learn. That sort of having having passion for 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 the device or the field that you're in, and you know being able to develop relationships, I think is hugely uh, important. And really, you know, understanding the, the 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 data, understanding the data behind your behind your device, I think is hugely hugely important because it's it's critical when you're going into some of these meetings. You know, you can you can talk about how great the device is, for example, but uh, you know a lot of doctors are going to want to know that there is clinical evidence behind what you're telling them and. Being able to, you know, articulate that and having a really good understanding of that clinical data, I think is hugely important. So I, I obviously didn't have the, the sort of the medical or the life sciences or background, um, but I was able to put, put those things together and really just, um, you know, work hard and, and, and try and understand as much as I can really sort of, you know, absorb as much information as I could. And luckily I had the, you know, the inventor of the device that I could, you know, get on the phone to at any time and say, you know, dad, I had this question today didn't really understand you know the best way to answer it and you know I could get I could get a good explanation from the expert which which you know worked to my worked in my advantage well that definitely helped yes <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> and so what was the best thing about it because obviously we talk about the challenges how difficult it was you know getting the knowledge on but what what was it that, that when you were doing it got you through those days and, and used you yeah, absolutely. The, you know, the best thing by, by far for me was working or being part of something that could potentially have a huge impact on the lives of mothers and, and their babies. You know, we, we, we talked about the, the, the story about why, the, why my father developed the device where they, you know, very tragically lost the baby. And this, this device is essentially making those deliveries easier and safer for both the mother and the baby. So, you know, we, we can't quantify um, how many babies' lives have potentially been saved by this device, um, how many mothers have, you know, um, suffered less complications through the use of this device. So I think that, that by far, I, I saw that early on, you know, when, when you're out there having these conversations and you speak to doctors and they, they say, oh, you know, I had one of these cases, you know, fortunately, you know, it, maybe the outcome wasn't as bad as the, the, the story that we, we've talked about already, but they had one of these cases and they they you can really sort of you know hear how difficult those cases have been for the doctors so be able to bring something to them that can help manage these difficult deliveries and with the possibility that we could bring this global uh, and have this impact on mothers and babies across the world you know that for me that was um that was really the sort of best thing about about all of this so yeah so effectively having a purpose um and actually seeing that, that purpose was going to make a significant difference which i think again uh, you know for people listening that's that's a key uh part and people obviously like to make money but you know as they always say what makes work enjoyable and make it not seem like work is when you have a clear purpose that you can see that the work i'm putting in is going to be something that is going to make a difference and that allows you as you, uh, the second thing you said about it is around passion it allows you to have that passion because you, you, you continue driving and striving to deliver something. So uh, uh, interestingly, because obviously we're talking about globalizing the product and you just mentioned it there about, you know, going global. So the next question is really around, so how do you then define, you know, what market you're going to go to? Because obviously you, you're in the UK, you've got a few accounts, uh, you're getting to know the business. What's the next step? How do you, how do you start to really expand that out to blow it up? Yeah, so, you know, 
obviously we the three of us uh, were, were based in in the uk so the the uk was obviously the first market that we entered we obviously had a, a c mark for the product which opened up europe for us as well so we did sort of start branching out into some of the european countries as well interestingly we were approached by a hospital in australia um, where they had actually lost a baby in a very similar clinical scenario and they had sort of gone away and done some research to try and find out what devices might be available to try and help um, you know alleviate eliminate some of these risks and they approached us and said oh is, is the fetal pillow is it available in Australia uh, it, it wasn't available in Australia at the time um, but there was clearly interest from you know one of the one of the sort of big hospitals in in, in the country um, we then went through the, the regulatory process, uh, approval process to get into Australia uh, and eventually New Zealand as well. We also, we, we saw huge demand in Australia. Uh, we actually ended up setting up a subsidiary in Australia and employing someone over there as well to manage the business. So that was really, that very quickly became our second sort of largest market, Australia and New Zealand, um, followed, you know, sort of uh, UK being the, the first largest market in the beginning. We ultimately had a goal to enter the, the US market because it's interesting when you look at some of the data that's out there in terms of the number of sort of maternity units, I think there's probably about 160 in the UK, there's about three and a half to 4,000 in the US. So, you, you know, you can see the, the, the difference in market size. Um, the US is really the sort of was the ultimate, ultimate market that we wanted to enter, but we obviously had to go through a, a large process in terms of getting the FDA clearance for the device, we, over the years, there was a lots of clinical data that was published on the fetal pillow as well. So all of that sort of accumulated uh, and that really helped us eventually get the FDA clearance in late 2017. Uh, and then at that point, the US really did become our primary focus. And then, so interesting enough, oh, there's a bit of an echo there, but I did not say. <laughs> Interesting enough, in terms of America as a market, obviously, as you said, it's one of the biggest markets from a maternity point of view, and actually in virtually every business sphere, America <laughs> tends to be one of those goals that people think, if I can get in there, I can make it. Mm -hmm. um, why, why did you make the decision that you were going to personally work it? Because obviously in Australia, you, re you employed somebody, obviously you were working in the UK. You know, most people would have thought, well, actually, you're not American. You don't know the market that well surely there's better people over there to do it why, why did you take that decision actually i'm gonna i'm gonna focus on that market personally yeah definitely so you know we we were looking at ways that we could commercialize the product in the us um we even sort of pre pre fda clearance for our device we did spend um sort of several years going out to the us and attending some of the national conferences so we had slowly start to build up a, uh, a database of you know, doctors around the country and hospital systems that we might want to target. And a lot of people were interested and said, you know, reach back out to us once you have the device um, cleared by the FDA. Um, so we had started building up a, a network. We had also come into contact with several sort of independent distributors around the country as well that were very interested in potentially working with us once we had the device ready. But at the same time, we also didn't know much about the US market ourselves. I mean, we obviously there's, you know, you can learn, you can learn about it by being at home and being on the internet and, and you know, researching the market itself, which we did a lot of that as well, of, of course. Um, but really, uh, we felt that the best way that we could learn about the market ourselves was again, to sort of be on the ground and be in the field and sort of be on the front line there and really be out there having conversations directly with doctors, um, understanding what their pain points were, understanding um, were, were they were they facing these difficult, challenging situations as we've experienced in the in the UK as well? Um, and really having those conversations, that was going to be the best way to, to learn. Also, you know, sort of having those initial conversations with a doctor and then having to present the product to the, a department meeting, then having it go through the sort of value analysis process, and then having to go through purchasing and then understanding the training requirements ongoing and getting them set up as a supplier that, you know, there was a whole host of things that we had to learn about that we couldn't do without sort of being, being do, but by doing it directly, that was, that was the best way. Um, so it, it sort of, in, in that context, uh, I made the decision that I would go and spend some time in New York, just logistically, uh, not too far to get to in terms of traveling. 
I'd spent a lot of time in London, uh, New York, you know, obviously many differences, but there, it, it was a big city. And I felt that a lot of what I had done over the years in London could at least be transferred over to, to New York in a sense. Turns out that it was, you know, quite, quite different in many, many respects. But I essentially started building a, a, a business, a base of business in, in New York from, from scratch. I didn't really know anyone there. Um, you know, I had a few leads from some of the conferences. I started reaching out to people and, yeah, people were, luckily there were a couple of hostels at the beginning that were willing to meet with me and I met, met with them very early on and got them on board very, very quickly. And they became great reference sites. And I, you know, quickly started expanding across New York and, uh, you know, sort of fast forward, I guess, three, three years or three to four years prior to the acquisition. You know, we now, we, at that point, we had basically the major hostel systems in New York using fetal pillow. Uh, really just from from the hard work that I put in and the lot of the you know copious amounts of travel I um <laughs> I sort of put myself through in, in in getting over there um my my colleague who I mentioned as well he he worked with us he spent some time um on, on the east coast he was also on the west coast sorry he was traveling around as well uh, we had started getting some independent distributors on board so you know we were sort of sharing that workload I was focused more on the east coast he was focused on the west coast and a bit of Texas as well we spent a lot of time going out to train these distributors as well, because that was hugely crucial in, in getting them up to speed and making sure that they were saying the right things when they were going out to customers. And, uh, you know, that's probably a, 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 you know, a separate topic we can touch upon, but there, you know, that was, um, that was the, the kind of main reason was to, to learn, learn about the U S market was the, the reason why we kept on some of the calls. Thanks. And then you, you just mentioned that you, obviously you got New York so just as a matter of interest. What's the, what's the size of the, uh, the the New York market specifically compared to the UK. Well, I think you said earlier there's about 160 maternity units in the UK. How many in in the New York area? Oh, in New York. I mean, if you look at New York State, there's probably about two two hundred hospitals, something like that. So it's you know similar in size to the whole of the UK in terms of the number of hospitals. Yeah, and that's just one state, isn't it? So so it makes yeah, exactly that, that just tends to show people why. Obviously, if you're in the medical space to go to the U to, to the US, there's a massive opportunity. Even though the UK is still a big market, uh, it, it, it's dwarfed in comparison uh, to the, the US, really, because you're talking about one state. It's comparable to the whole of the UK, so that's that's really absolutely and probably about probably I can't remember the exact statistics now, but probably about fifty of those hospitals make up you know sort of seventy five percent of the of the birthing numbers because you've got some huge hospitals there as well they're delivering you know between eight and ten thousand babies which is uh which was interesting to us because you know in coming from the uk you know you sort of a big hostel would you know delivering four thousand babies plus would be considered a large hospital and in the, in the us you know that isn't necessarily a big hospital it's for a rel relatively average size hospital there's some really really big birthing units over there which is something that we, that we learn okay that, that which which is very useful and come back to understanding the market and understanding the data because that then dictates what you then do from a commercial point of view. Um, so, so moving on, in terms of if someone was to come to you now and say, right, Nishan, I've got a new product, I want to get into, you know, I want to go global. What would be the key tips, key kind of, I mean, we talked about few, through a few of them, but it'd just be useful to, you know, from your point of view, what would be those key things that you'd say, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's there's so, so much that you can do, but if I was to try and condense it into a few sort of key themes, I think the preparation and planning is is really crucial to your commercial success. You really want to perform exhaustive research on your prospective market. I mean, if we take the the example of the US um, for us, we we obviously did a huge amount of research uh, on on the market. We looked at specific states we looked at where the birthing numbers were concentrated we looked at within those particular states what were the top 10 hospitals by birth for example so we could really pinpoint who were the key customers to target so i think that's hugely hugely important um you know if you're looking at sort of on a wider scope that the sort of preparation planning can include you know what are the regulatory approvals that you'll need uh, what is the um, what is the infrastructure that you need to set up in in those different territories? You know whether it's the sort of legal entities and things like that that you need to need to look at setting up. How do you build a team? You know that's crucial as well. Um, who are the key opinion leaders? What is the potential market size? What are the key conferences to attend? So I mean these these really all fall within sort of preparation and planning. A lot of this you can do 
prior to even entering the the, the the potential market you can really get your get you know get things in order get your get your sort of market research performed so you really go in with a clear mind of where you're going to efficiently allocate your resources to achieve the the, the best sort of outcomes um another another point that i think is very important and that's i, I feel like uh, we we found this with our experience is you know building uh, relationships and building a network uh, and uh, again that's that's quite a wide net that could be building relationships with uh, you know doctors potentially in in your market with key opinion leaders building credibility um, building relationships with your your distributors for example who are out there selling the product um, building relationships with you know the um, who are the, the the sort of regulatory uh, approval uh, providers as well so really it, this sort of boils down to building a good team. I think you need to have the right team uh, on board to support your global expansion plans. Uh, you can't do it alone. I think that's what we found. You know, there's really a small team. I mentioned there was three of us in the UK. We had someone in Australia as well. So really a company with four employees uh, and we were looking to try and bring this global. So we did have to build uh, a team and outsource, um, outsource some of the functions to sort of local experts, you know, whether it's distributors, direct sales reps, uh, or key opinion leaders. I think the other thing to mention is having um, having an international marketing plan in place. Um, you know, I touched upon this already, but how how do you, with especially with a small team, and you're trying to globalize your product, how how do you get get out there, um, get your message out there, essentially? Um, and this could be, you know, I, I mentioned that we attended a lot of the major national conferences, so. We were creating a, a small buzz, I get, I would say, in, in, in the background, even though our device wasn't available yet on the, on, on the market. We were creating some interest. We, are, we were you know, building, building networks, building a database of potential leads. Uh, we did a lot of uh, marketing in some of the sort of national journals in, in the US, for example. Uh, we would take out one page spreads where we would sort of have our product, we'd have a you know, really great sort of product um, uh, brochure or one page spread in, in the magazines. Um, and that, you know, and particularly during the pandemic, we were trying to build our business in the US, you know, during the pandemic. So we really did have to pivot to uh, other forms of sort of marketing, whether it be, you know, online, online education programs, online training platforms for, for doctors that had the device, but we couldn't physically go over there and train them. Um, so those are the things that were important. I think one other thing to mention is you know we talk all about the, the sort of selling and building the business uh, but i think it's crucial also to ensure you have the infrastructure in place for global expansion mm. um, and by this i mean you know if you're looking to set up subsidiaries in different com in countries you know have the correct corporate structure in place you need to start having your sort of payments and billing systems in place i mean these, these are things that we learned about the us because we didn't know anything about this so this is something we really had to figure out as we went along um, having the right logistics providers in place. How are you going to get the product to your customer? Uh, the, you know, depending on where your product's manufactured, how are you going to get it over to the country of where you're trying to distribute the product, for example? Uh, you know, what are the laws for import, importing devices into that country? Um, and, uh, you know, how are you going to store the product? And what are your sort of shipment channels? You know, you can execute on your sales plans, but if you can't get the product to the customer, you'll, you'll quickly uh, lose credibility. So I think having an infrastructure in place um, is important. I probably, uh, you know, <laughs> probably gave a, a lot of information there, but feel free to, um, you know, if there's anything you want to talk about specifically. No, I think, I think all of those are really important. So I'm just going to recap. So it's a pre preparation and planning, um, which I think is, is uh, I, I bang on about that all the time. I think that, you know, too many businesses and too many individuals are so keen to get out and do and, and you know i've got fantastic products you know the market's there i just need to get out there and i think that uh, that's the downfall of many businesses because they're not prepared and they haven't planned um and given it enough uh, basically uh, enough time to look at what they need to do then you said building relationships and basically building a good team really uh, and then uh, have you know a marketing plan in place which is, is key you know, how are you going to get the message out there? How are you going to get people to know about it? And then leading on from that, yeah, it's great to have the messages going out there, but if you haven't got the infrastructure to get the product to the people, whether that's logistics, regulation, et cetera, uh, then you, you will lose credibility. And that's one of the things that I wrote down, actually, when you're talking about building a good team and building a network is about getting credibility. Uh, and that comes from data and lots of other ways of doing that. So people actually believe that actually, that it's not just believing in the products, it's believing in the company 
who's going to deliver the product and the people that they're speaking to so they feel comfortable yes this is this is a company i want to do business with um and then just on on the uh, the area around building your team building a network so how do you um ensure when you've got a small team because a lot of people listen to this will be small to medium-sized businesses you've got a small team you go into the us or you're going anywhere in the world actually um you can't build subsidiaries in every country you can't go to every country yourself how do you ensure that the partners that you that you that you choose are the right partners and are going to do the things in the way that you would do them or you want them to do them or need to be done yeah no it's, it's a great question it's it's a, it's a tough one you know i think um you know for us we we were so new to the us and we we had we had been given some you know, introductions to some of these independent distributors and the introductions were you know sort of glowing recommendations you should you, you know work with with this team um, in this particular state for example uh, so we, we to be honest you know looking back we didn't really know any better at the time uh, we were going off these sort of recommendations and we did work we started working with distributors i think we had about probably eight independent distributors uh, working um, for us around the us they each had probably you know six or seven reps working for them looking at different um, different part different states uh, so we had we had good coverage of the country with these distributors um, but re really I would say half of them were performing very well, half of them were not performing very well. Um, and I think it's now with hindsight, we can look back and say that, you know, we potentially would have done things a little bit differently. Um, and this may have involved, you know, more carefully sort of vetting these distributors up, up front. And I think, you know, the way we probably would have done that were would have been before we sort of went into any formal, um, you know, contract with them. I think we would have potentially spent some some time with them, you know, face to face, spend some time with them potentially in, in the field, uh, asking them to maybe set up some initial meetings, um, introduce us to some of their contacts potentially, uh, and maybe test the waters a little bit and really get a good feel for um, if these are these are people that you can work with for the for the long term and that you feel that they they are you know genuinely going to add value to your business and you know support you and help you in, in sort of building your business. It works two ways, of course, you know, if they're not doing a good job there, they're not going to, um, you know, reap the rewards either. So it really has to be a sort of two way relationship. But I think getting to know, uh, getting to know the those that you're going to, to work with and really trying to understand, you know, um, their, their relationship, their, their sort of history in the industry um, and, and really try and gauge whether they, they will be able to, uh, to, to sort of add value. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, it's almost like a recruitment process, isn't it? Whether it is a, an individual you're recruiting, i.e., you know, you set up a subsidiary and, you set, and you're recruiting some individuals, or you are recruiting distributors or partners in other countries, it's, it's about that vetting process, isn't it? And, and doing as much work as you can to check their credentials uh, mm -hmm. and check that they actually can deliver on what they said uh, that they, they can deliver on, because I think we've all anyone who's been in international business uh, and said that every partner that they choose has been fantastic would be a liar. Uh, we've all made mistakes um, and we'll continue to do so, but you, you become probably better at asking the right questions, doing the right things, and then therefore choosing the right partner. So that's, that's um, a, a, an interesting point. And actually leads me into my next question would be, uh, and that's probably one of them, is you know, we've talked about what the key things that you need to do. What, what are the things that you'd say yeah, whatever you do, don't do the following. What you know, what are the key pitfalls you'd suggest that you want you'd want to avoid? Yeah, I mean, you know, for us specifically, and again, it sort of touches on the point about choosing the right people to work with. I think, you know, even when you do make those make that decision that you found, you know, the the right person to work with, whether it's someone you recruit to work for you directly as an employee, or whether it's a distributor, for example. I think it's hugely, hugely important um, that sort of onboarding and training process for for that person. You know, whether it's someone working for you directly, whether it's a distributor, you really need to um, make sure that your training is effective, so that when they go out to speak with a customer, for example, again, you know, sort of, I'm very much specifically talking about the sort of medical device sales perspective, but if if they're going out to potential partner meeting or potentially to meet with a doctor and this is maybe the first time that that doctor is hearing about this device 
And if you have someone there that is uh, trying to present the product, trying to uh, talk through the, the benefits, the clinical data, the, the, the value, the, the potential savings for the hospital from a financial point of view, they need to make sure that they are articulating that message correctly. If, for example, they haven't been trained correctly and they sort of go into that meeting and they maybe get a difficult question from the doctor and rather than sort of maybe they should, you know, they should really say, well, you know, let me get, get back to you on that because I'm not, I'm not too sure uh, of the answer, for example, just being honest. They may try and, you know, wing it a little bit or they may try and sort of try and try and answer the question because they don't want to um, look like they don't know. And they may say something incorrect, for example, because I think there's a very fine line in sort of, you know, medical devices that you, you have to really stick to the facts, you know, the data that's out there behind your device. You can't say anything that's factually incorrect. And that, you know, that one conversation could very, very quickly damage your credibility as a company. It could, it could cause that doctor to very much sort of go off the idea of having your product uh, in their department um, just from that one interaction. So, you know, that's something that I really, really emphasize that it, it, hugely important that, that whoever's going out there to, to talk about your product uh, has been trained correctly is articulating the correct message. Because I think once you have that, if you have a bad meeting, as a, especially as a first meeting, it can be very, very difficult to sort of backtrack, and try and win them over. Um, you really, you know, it takes you sort of several steps backwards. Um, that's important. I think, again, you know, touching upon something we talked about previously, the, the sort of infrastructure in place. You know, we we our product was manufactured in you know in, in China, so there was a whole host of logistics that we had to consider in getting our product from China to the US. We then had to you know get a uh, someone to store the product for us. Um, so we ended up outsourcing the storage and logistics to a company over over there. Um, but if you haven't sort of got all of that in order, and for example, uh, you've got a delay in getting your product over to the US, which can then have a knock on effect of product being, you know, on back order out of stock, for example, you know, luckily we didn't have this problem because we sort of manage this very carefully, but it's definitely a, a sort of important pitfall to avoid because again, if a customer has been used to using your, it's been, you know, sort of the product's been embedded in their practice and, and then suddenly they can't get hold of the product for a week or two. It can cause real panic in the hospital because the, you know, these are potentially life-saving devices. Uh, and again, that can really sort of, you know, damage your credibility as well. So I think they're two, two sort of key pitfalls that come to mind. Yeah, that, and I think that they're, 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 they're probably the key ones, aren't they? That, you know, you haven't, you know, so you haven't trained people effectively or people are winging it, uh, which um, is uh, generally the, the winging it is normally a result of, not being trained effectively and not understanding the, the product or the service that they're selling. And then, you know, supply chain and logistics, making sure that you can get uh, your product from where it's made to where it's actually supposed to be on a regular basis without having back orders, et cetera. Because, you know, yes, exactly. And, and that's actually, obviously, in the medical devices, it's much more important. But, you know, nowadays with the, the advent of places like Amazon, um, you know, not... Being out of out of stock and being on back order is almost like unfathomable. People mm. will not really tolerate it in, in no. this. You know, I, I order something today. It's here tomorrow morning or actually sometime in the evening. Uh, yeah. So yeah. not being able to get stuff is like really <laughs> bad news. So just just as a matter of interest, I mean, because I remember I, I did I had a a podcast uh, probably about a year eighteen months ago when we were talking about commercialization of businesses and they were talking um about how if you're setting a business up to sell you'd set it up slightly differently or you'd do different things than if you were just setting it up to be there for time and more so when you went into the business with your dad did you or your dad have the view that you were going to sell it or was it actually we'll just keep going as long as we can go yeah it's, it's a great it's a great question and if i look back to when, when I first joined the business or, you know, when my father first, first started the business, I, I, at, at that point, there wasn't any, any plan to, to sort of sell the business. I think it was, it was so early on that my, my dad was essentially trying to solve a problem. And I don't, I don't think he ever thought it would make it this far, you know, to where we are today, having this sort of conversation. Um, but back then, he was really trying to solve a problem. He, he didn't want any parent to go through this situation he never wanted any parent to lose a baby during one of these you know types of cesarean sections 
So his initial goal was to solve a problem. And I think once it started gaining some traction, it, it, it sort of really gave us satisfaction that we could get this product out to, to more hospitals and therefore help more mothers and babies. And really, our plan at the time was just to continue growing the business. Um, you know, we, we were learning as we went along. We didn't necessarily know the, be the be best way to, to do this. Um, but we knew that we could start building the product, building the business in, in Europe with the, with the plans for the, uh, for the US market as well. Um, fortunately, there was a lot of clinical data I mentioned before accumulating um, over, over the years as well. And I think that was really sort of helping our momentum because now we could go into these meetings and not to do a maybe initially um, could then see that there was a lot of clinical data and it was becoming more and more difficult to, to argue with the benefits of, of the product. So I think we could we could really start to see that there was a real potential for this business. Um, this was a problem that was undoubtedly going to be the same everywhere across the globe. So there was no reason why uh, the fetal pillow wouldn't be helpful for every hospital in, in, in the world, essentially. Um, we were obviously a small team, as I mentioned, so we were sort of limited in resources, um, but we, 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 we definitely planned to keep building the business and we had thoughts of maybe bringing in more products and, uh, and sort of developing other ideas, but all of our focus ended up going into fetal pillows, especially when we had the approval for the US market. And I think, you know, we, we, we probably, once we had the approval for the US and we started seeing, um, you know, the success in the US market and how much interest there was, I think that's when we probably started realizing that at, at some point there probably be, we, will be interest from a bigger player. Um, and, you know, in the end, we, we never went out actively looking for a potential acquirer. We really put all of our focus into growing the business. And we sort of said, look, let's just continue to grow the business. If, if, if someone does come along and, you know, want to sort of start that discussion, then we'd be open to it. Um, but we, went, we were not actively looking uh, for an exit. And in the end, as I mentioned, someone did approach us, um, the company that ended up acquiring us. I mean, they had, we had had conversations with them for sort of five plus years. They had seen us at some of the national conferences. So they, you know, looking back, they probably were keeping uh, an eye on us as a, as a business and they probably had some plans. They probably were monitoring uh, our success. And especially when we went to the US, they were probably keeping a close eye on, on how we were doing. And I think, you know, I think the bottom line for us was as a, as a small team, we were probably limited in, in terms of how, how many hospitals we could get this out to, how many countries we could get this out to. So in the end, if our sort of ultimate goal was to try and get this out to as many mothers and babies across the world, it was really only going to be possible with a big player on board and a big player taking it forward. So that was, you know, um, a, a, another important factor for us. Um, and obviously financially, it, it, someone had to offer, you know, make an offer that would reflect the value of the business. So that was, a, you know, another, another important part of the process, of course. Which, which is where your uh, chartered accountant background uh, comes in very, very handy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I, I obviously studied my accounting qualification and then there were just, you know, there are times though, during the whole journey where, you know, some of my accounting knowledge became really, really helpful. And uh, also my um, experience at the investment bank as well. That was really, really helpful as well when it came to the, the sort of the, the exit process itself. So, yeah, absolutely. It all sort of, uh, it, uh, yeah, came into use later on. I mean, it's interesting because they do say that they build it and they and they will come. And I yeah. think that what I take from what you're saying, which I think is really quite motivational to people who maybe want to build a business and may well be thinking at some point in the future that, that they would need to sell it, just as you did in terms of to really take it global. Um, it's about having a good idea, implementing that idea, making sure there's a market for it, working on it, you know, nurturing it and driving it forward because if you if, if you have that and you're doing that and you're focusing on building a business automatically people will notice that you're doing it i think sometimes and i've seen some businesses fail where they they start with a view i'm just going to sell it you know wrap it up put lipstick on a pig as they say so that actually looks attractive mm -hmm. to external people but it's never going to you know once someone starts kicking the tires you know the tires are going to fall off where if you actually focus on building a solid business with good customer base, good relationships, 
that's when you're much more likely to be able to get someone who's interested in in the business so i, th I think that's that was really useful uh just to understand that uh from your point of view so so what's next then because obviously we, I, I, the intro said you know you're looking at your next business because you've obviously sold this business out you've done very well what's what's next for you and your you and your dad is it going to be you and your dad is it just you what how, how does that move forward yeah no uh, so you know, we, once we sold the business in March of 21, I was employed uh, by the acquiring company for a one year period. So that was a, that was a great learning experience. Um, I worked, worked with them for a year and really helped sort of train their, their sales teams you know, across the US. Um, and that sort of came to an end of March of this year. So it's been sort of six months and actually I decided to take some time off. Um, so <laughs> I, I sort of decided I'm going to take six months off and really just spend spend some time with uh, with my family um, spend some time with my daughter and just you know in, enjoy a bit of bit of bit of time off but in my nature is I, I can't I can't take much take take too much time <laughs> off you know I uh, I can't sit around my, my wife jokes that you know if we go on a beach holiday after about a day I'm sort of saying okay what, what, what are we gonna do now you know <laughs> I can't sit around for too long so um, you know my, my plan was always to try and get involved with a few few different things and I think we've, we've learned so much in this journey that I think um, it would be a shame not to, to 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 bring that experience and you know potentially try and build build something uh, again you know some some people might call us uh, <laughs> crazy for for even thinking about doing that but I think um, it, again I'll, I will be partnering up with with my father he I think I mentioned um, sort of earlier on earlier on in the conversation that he's always thought there's room for innovation in, in obstetrics so he's he's always had a few a few ideas you know in the background so i think he's uh you know he's got out his uh, old notepad and uh you know dusted it off and um there's a few ideas in there that he thought of you know many years ago and uh you know no one's brought no one's developed any of those ideas you know so they're still they're still sort of out there for taking i think so he's um he's keen he's keen to keen to you know develop some, some new devices and um that that's the plan so we're going to try and develop sort of one or two devices over the next uh, next year or so and um, we're going to get working on that pretty pretty soon um so i will we'll, we'll be working uh, together again and, um, and i think it'll be great because I'll, I'll i'll have an opportunity to use some of the the network that i've built you know keep in contact with them reach out to them again and bring them something new and um you know i think it'll be be quite exciting and i think we would also probably do things differently and you know looking back um there, there, there's several things that we've learned and uh, we had a great success we had a great outcome with 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 the business um but there there are things that we could potentially do differently um being more efficient in our in our use of resources in certain certain aspects and um you know as i mentioned about the sort of distributor that we set up we we you know we'd be sort of more careful with that we you know do we do we even go to the uk this time do we potentially go straight to the us you know that's something that we are contemplating when we're sort of you know putting our early plans in place um so that's that's the sort of the, the longer term goal which we're going to get working on um, pretty soon um you know i've hugely enjoyed working in this field working in women's health and um i've, I've really enjoyed the journey the process and uh, learned a lot um so the other thing that i'm also interested in potentially you know working with one or two other companies that are operating in a in a very similar space um uh, and if i can help them anyway uh, to make an impact and help them with their growth plans or commercializing the product in the us you know i'd be you know happy to do so and um i think the third thing that i'm looking at um is potentially looking at some you know sort of investment opportunities uh we've we, you know we've been approached by a couple of small businesses sort of medical device medical technology um so we are assessing the potential you know some potential angel investment opportunities um but they're just early stages and uh, we will we'll, we'll see where we go with those so Excellent. that's kind so, of uh, in a nutshell where <laughs> where i am at the moment so, so your wife's definitely right so you, you've got a lot of a lot of irons in the back you, <laughs> you you're restless yeah. uh it happens yeah. to be a fair <laughs> a fair way to go so, so but just just to wrap up uh and thanks very much for your time um if there was one piece of advice you could leave with my listeners and my audience about uh, if you're going to commerce try and globalize a product you know invent a product globalize a product um what would that piece of advice be yeah absolutely i think um you know there's from what we've learned there's there's a lot of uh you know a lot of good bits of advice that i could potentially give and, and share i think 
for, from our experience, I think if there's if there's something that you are you know trying to achieve or something that you're passionate about, or there's a business that you'd like to start, or you'd like to take your product uh, global, for example, um, I I would suggest you know really just going for it and taking a calculated risk. You know, you don't need to sort of risk, put everything at risk, uh, but you also don't want to look back, you know, 10, 20 years and wish you had sort of taken that calculated risk. Um, if we look at my, my, my dad, for example, you know, he was passionate about improving the field of obstetrics and preventing poor outcomes, such as the tragic situation that we've, we've discussed. Uh, he took a real risk to try and bring something brand new to the market. And, um, you know, he, he was still practicing at the time. He didn't give up his, his, his practice. He was still working full time. He, it's something I didn't mention, he's still working now. He's still practicing two and a half days a week. He never, he never gave up his practice because he, he enjoys it so much. He's, he's so passionate about it. Uh, and he's still working to this day and he's going to continue to do so. Um, but sort of that being said, you know, I think with, with, with the fetal pillow, he can, if he didn't take that sort of risk at the time, you know, we wouldn't be where we are today, but he can now look back 10 years later and he can be very proud of what he what he's achieved and the the kind of ongoing impact that he'll have on his field with, with this device. And for me personally, I also took a calculated risk in sort of leaving my career when I, I was at Barclays and I, I sort of left left my left my job, you know, quite abruptly in a way. You know, my my boss at the time when I sort of told him what I was going to do, he was he was kind of shocked. He was very <laughs> had a very skeptical look on his face and he sort of said, Are you are you sure? <laughs> are you sure you want, want to do this? Um you know, I knew that in a worst case scenario, if, the, if it didn't work out with, with this business, that I could have gone back into the world of finance. Um, but now I really can look back and say it was the, the best life decision that I've, I've ever made. Um, and that's for, for various reasons. You know, I think I, it was just, an, it's been an incredible journey. Um, so that, that would be my sort of piece of advice is, you know, if there's something you want to go for, just take it, take a calculator, calculated risk and, and sort of go for it. Very good advice and an absolutely perfect place, I think, on which to come bring it to a close. So Nishant Varma, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. That's a wrap, as they say. Uh, well, I think they do anyway. Uh, well, somebody does. Anyway, <laughs> as I said at the beginning, I'm a bit of a healthcare nerd. So I love hearing about how people successfully market these kind of products. What I hope everybody listening gets from this is the fact that healthcare is a complicated landscape with many decision makers and lots of regulation, which makes the sales cycle and process a long and arduous one. And in fact, it forces you therefore to be regimented in approach and relentless. And in my belief, that's exactly what you need to succeed in any business. And I hope that you pick that up. So remember what Nishant said, you know, you need to have an idea, but you need to add action to it. You need to have evidence and prepare and plan meticulously. You need to have relationships and you need to have a passion to bring those relationships to life. And you need to have the correct infrastructure if you want to go global. And that's really just the top line. If you've listened to it, you know, there's so much to unpick and you're probably going to want to go back and listen to it again and pick some of those things out. But what I really hope is that these episodes show that it doesn't take any one type of person to be successful and every time i interview somebody else from a different background with different products and services i do that for several reasons the first one is that i want to ensure that you'll always find someone that you can resonate with and secondly as i said it shows that lots of different types and behaviors can lead to success and finally the more you hear a wider range of views the more you learn so as I always say, don't forget to check out the show notes at www.thesalesaccelerationformula.com. And if you like what you heard, subscribe, like, and share with your friends, share with your colleagues and whoever else you can. But most of all, keep the feedback coming so that we can continue to improve and give you more of what you say that you like. Really hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed recording it. Keep listening and keep growing.